I tell them I am the dragon lady. <laughs> Do not mess with me. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissin. And this is a show for you if you're bored of watching people on the internet having arguments over something they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts. We ask the experts. Our fantastic expert guest this week is a headmistress of the Michaela Free School here in London, Catherine Burble Singh. Welcome to Trigonometry. Thanks for having me. It's so good to have you here. Uh, we know everything about you. We've seen the great interview you did with Dave Rubin and others. But Sounds creepy, mate, but anyway, carry on. <laughs> wow, that, that's a good start to the interview. Uh, but uh, for anyone who, who doesn't know who you are, tell us a little bit about your story through life. How are you, where you are, and what, what, what brings you to the seat in which you currently sit? Okay, well, um, Catherine Bearable Singh is my name. I'm a headmistress of uh, Michaela Community School, which is a school in Brent, uh, Wembley Park. Uh, we opened in 2014. Uh, we now have 600 pupils, and this year is the year we get our GCSE results, so it's really exciting. Um, I suppose people are interested, uh, or you are interested in talking to me because um, I'm a bit controversial in the things that I say about education. Uh, the stuff I say I think is pretty much common sense, but others find it controversial. I think teachers should stand in front of the class and teach. That is controversial. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I, I came to prominence, I suppose, in 2010 when I gave a speech at the Conservative Party conference. Um, a teacher at the Conservative Party conference? Yeah, <gasps> yeah. Well, I have to say, I didn't really know much about political conferences. Anyway, I went along and I gave this speech, but it was also what I said in the speech. I was kind of condemning the state of state education and saying how uh, lots needed to change. Um, and I, I now am I'm trying to en enact that at, at school. And uh, uh, we at Michaela, so all of my teachers, my senior team, we all uh, sing from the same hymn sheet. We really believe the same sorts of things. And we now get visitors. I don't know. We get seven to ten visitors every day. Uh, they're all teachers, tend to be, uh, from across the country and across the world who come to see what we do. Um, so it's been really powerful uh, in terms of uh, putting the argument forward because uh, teachers have been able to to see the the arguments in theory in real life mm. uh, and, and to see whether or not they work. Um, and, and I think they do. And I, and I always say to everybody, you're very welcome to come and visit any time. Uh, our doors are open all the time and people come every day and they have lunch with the children. And they have a tour uh, and they're able to judge for themselves. Well, we look forward to coming. You invited us very kindly. Yeah. We'll check it yeah. out. Uh, but let, let's get into some of the stuff that you do. You've been described as Britain's strictest headmistress. <laughs> uh, well, I think they were trying to sell the newspaper at the time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about being the strictest. I think when people talk about... Uh, being strict. People mm. imagine this kind of ogre standing over children and it all being really mean and nasty. When in fact, the number one thing that everyone says when they come to the school is the children are so happy. It's just a really happy place. And the reason why they're happy is precisely because it's ordered and structured. It's when you have chaos that children are miserable and unhappy because children look to us to guide them. They, it's our duty to, to show them the way and to allow the shy ones to shine. In, at Michaela, one of the things teachers uh, visit, they, they look in the classrooms and they say, it's incredible, all the kids have their hands up. And that's because no one at Michaela feels intimidated. You can find in classrooms that, not with us, but elsewhere, you, if a child puts their hand up, are they going to get bullied for putting their hand up? Are they going to be laughed at? Oh, you, you're just mm. the teacher's pet. You're the nerd. You know what I mean. I mean well, I was that one had... always. I was the nerd with my hand up. Yeah. Right, exactly. So you know from your own experiences at school what that was like. Um, that doesn't happen, Michaela. Uh, learning is really admired. And, and if you're able to answer, that's great. That means you've been listening. And so you'll find 75% of hands in the class will go up. Uh, and that's what I mean about having the order and the structure. If you have order, everyone's able to listen. If the teacher is standing at the front of the class, they're able, they can look in one direction to see the teacher. If the teacher is teaching in the way that we would consider to be excellent teaching, um, the children have a chance to, to, to really grapple with, with, with the subject and, and then be able to put their hands up and answer questions and then feel successful. And then their self-esteem goes through the roof. But um, 
we do things the other way around in that sense. Uh, so you might find more modern methods of teaching are trying to address their self-esteem. We don't address their self-esteem. We think about the learning. We make sure they learn. And guess what? Their self-esteem then benefits because they're learning. Because it's very interesting that you say excellent teaching because I've been on, I was a teacher for 10 years in primary and secondary. And the idea of what good teaching is seemed to change year upon year upon year because education is a political football in the UK. So what do you think is excellent teaching for you? Uh, yeah, and it's a really good point. Uh, things do change all the time. Um, and to a certain extent, there is some value in change because uh, people... Um, you don't want to just be stuck in the same way. So we change our minds all the time. One of the things that people think is, oh, well, at Michaela, they just have one way of doing things. Well, that's just not true. <laughs> we have changed our mind over the years, and we also change our minds daily about things. So change isn't necessarily bad. Uh, but some of the ideas, I would say, have been bad over the last 50 years in education. So um, what has changed for the worse is that education has become more child-centered. And what I mean by that is, rather than the teacher leading the learning, it's the child that's leading the learning. And that comes from the idea that learning should always be personalized and that each child is his own self to be able to just discover what he wants. I want to be a dancer, I want to be an artist, I want to be a, you know, I want to work with computers. And that's fine, the idea of wanting to do what you want. But the teacher needs, who's the history teacher, needs to teach the history. And the child needs to learn from the teacher who knows more than them. Um, that concept has been lost. And to people who aren't in teaching, that seems really odd. Well, obviously, the history teacher knows more about history. But you'd be amazed by the number of teachers who say things like, I learn just as much from my children as, as, as the children learn from me. And I always think, well, OK, then you must not be a very good teacher. Something's <laughs> wrong there. Mm. And I'm not saying that the children can't point out little quirky things and they don't make you laugh. And I love working for chil with children for that reason. But, but the teacher ought to know more. The teacher ought to stand at the front of the class. The desk should be in rows. The children should look to the teacher. I always say the teacher is driving the bus, right? And the teacher drives the bus because children can't drive. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, we, but, but, and they can't. They can't drive, yeah. right? I mean, it, the thing is, in, in, in teaching, people don't think that. They think, no, 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 no. Children should just do, they should be in groups. And they should be looking at each other. So the teacher then moves around the desks as a facilitator of learning, as opposed to, no, I'm the teacher, I'm driving the bus forward, and all of the children are going to jump on the bus with me. And then a really excellent teacher is making sure that children don't jump off on en route. You're on your way to Rome, you don't want them jumping off at Paris. You don't want some of them never leaving home. You want to make sure that you are so skilled as a teacher that every time, oh, you're looking out the window, you jumped off the bus. Bing, little Johnny, come back in. Oh, you're doodling, you jumped off the bus. Okay, get back in. And you keep going, keep going until you get to Rome. And you are a brilliant teacher if you've managed to get to Rome and all the kids are still with you. Mm. So where's, you, you're really controversial. I haven't heard anything controversial so far. <laughs> what, well, what's controversial is, about this? That is really controversial, really controversial. What's well, I mean, a, a teacher standing in front of a class and being the leader in that, in that pro, that's controversial? Yeah. Why? Because... Um, I, I, I think it's because uh, too many people in teaching um, and actually in society nowadays have a problem with authority. Mm. Uh, they think that if you are an, uh, an, an author in authority, you are author authoritarian. And um, <clears throat> that's not true. Uh, in fact, if you're not in authority with children, then the children take control. Uh, the children are the ones who run that class. And then the teacher is just running around. No, please, please do some work. Silence, everyone. Silence. That's what they say. You know, you stand up in front of the class 10 minutes. Silence. And uh, anyone who's been in teaching will know what I'm talking about. Um, and that's because the children are, are, are running that class. And in fact, the idea of children running things is perfectly acceptable uh, in, in, in schools. I mean, they have student panels, for instance, where the students are deciding when a deputy head comes for an interview, the students are deciding whether or not the deputy head should be hired. I mean, now... What, really? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, quite, that's common. I've been interviewed by student panels. Yeah, it's perfect. Now, they're not the only ones deciding. Obviously. Look at my face, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're not the only... They're not the only ones deciding, but depending on the school, mm. they will give a certain amount of weight to what the children want. And... Um, that that's mad as far as I'm concerned. There are lots of things that you where you want to listen to them. So we have a year 11 committee for the ball, the year 11 ball when they leave and they're telling us where they want to go, which hotel to rent, all that kind of stuff. Great. 
they ought to be participating in that. We've got future leaders in the school who take our guests around and give them tours and they feed back to us about the school and so on. Yes, you know, are the toilets working? Do you have enough basketball hoops in the yard and all that sort of thing? We need their point of view. But do they know who, who makes a good deputy head? Do they know what makes a good teacher? Of course not. But um, that is very common in schools. That's just one example. Uh, the idea that the teacher should be the authority is controversial because they jump to the idea that they then must be authoritarian. And what I mean by that is they, they're mean and they, 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 they're oppressive. Mm. So people often come to the school thinking, well, it must be an oppressive place where children are miserable because the, the teachers are in charge, literally. But that's exactly the opposite is what you find. Children are thrilled because they're being led by their teachers, which is what they want. I always say, children push, we push back. They expect you to give them a detention if they misbehave. If you don't, then you are letting them down. It's very interesting you say that because especially when you work with kids who come from really difficult backgrounds mm. where there's not a lot of stability. To them, school is the one stable influence in their life where they're going to go in, they're going to be able to sit at the same place, the same thing is going to happen every day, they're going to get fed, and to them that is their safe place. And if you go in and you have this attitude of, you know, the ch child takes control, like you said, to a child, especially a young child, that is terrifying. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and it's not even just the shy children or the awkward children who are then eaten alive in that kind of system. But children who wouldn't have been bullies become bullies because they have to to survive, mm. right? Um, you know, there's that film uh, Wonder, which was based on the book uh, uh, by, by, about this little boy who's had lots of operations on his face and he goes, uh, he goes back to school. Julia, in the in the trailer, you see Julia Roberts uh, and the husband. I can't remember. It's one of the big American actors. And uh, they, they go to the school gates. And as I say, he's, 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 he's disfigured. And they send him off. And she hangs on to her husband and says, please, God, let them be kind to him. You know? And uh, the whole book is based on, can a boy who looks like this survive at school? Because it's going to be a nightmare for him. That would never happen at Michaela. It just wouldn't happen. Uh, in fact, we had a girl who was disfigured in various ways. I mean, she also had, she was severely SEN. And in, her, in the end, her mother decided to send her to a special school, but not because she was unhappy with Michaela, but because it was closer to their house and she'd got a, a place there. But um, the girl was crying when she was leaving, saying she was going to miss all her friends. And she loved it. And everybody was kind to her and nice to her. There was no bullying at all. And so um, I often think that book simply wouldn't exist if all schools were like Michaela. It's, so why aren't all... Sorry, Francis. No, I was going to say, just touching on the bullying element of it, one of the things that I noticed throughout my career and the things that I found actually quite distressing was the way bullying changed and metamorphosized, especially when it came to social media, bullying on social media. And I personally think social media is now one of the most damaging influences on our young children, especially on girls than it is on boys, because the amount of bullying, horrendous... The messages that I used to see, which I found upsetting, and they weren't even directed at me. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have a major push <clears throat> at school about social media. So that's the one place. So uh, bullying in the school doesn't happen, but it will happen on social media. And um, But what's great is that you cannot be involved in that if you don't have a smartphone, right? Mm. And we have a huge push. We, have, we give digital detox uh, events to the parents where parents are invited, and I talk them through the dangers of social media and the smartphones. My advice to all parents is do not give your child a smartphone, not until they're 16, possibly even 18. And that, again, is controversial. People think, well, why would you do that? Children are free they should be able to do what they like well you can do that there was one uh, young man not at our school who was in, with with tech posting certain things on youtube insulted a south london gang he was knifed to death uh there are other children i could tell you about um who they get involved in criminal activity they get involved in, in gang uh, activity because they meet these people through unsupervised access to the internet um and that's what the smartphone gives you unsupervised access to the internet uh, and we, want, we once used to put the porn magazines at the on the top shelf in the shops. Nowadays, well, you give, yourself, give your child a smartphone, they can access porn, they can access gambling, they can do anything they like on there. And parents are le a lot less tech savvy than uh, their, their children. And so children are running rings around their parents 
Um, my, my big advice is do not give them a smartphone. If you do, the iPhone, for instance, has all sorts of controls on there where you can put a password and you can block certain sites. Snapchat, Instagram, WhatsApp, they are toxic. You need to get off there. When you look at what, the way in which children will talk to each other, the bullying that goes on, the swearing, the, the, it's just, it's absolutely dreadful. Not to mention the way in which they will use technology just to take pictures of each other's homework, never really do their work. You are undermining your child massively if you give them a smartphone. It, it's really, really interesting that you say that because, you know, like we were talking about with the bullying element of it and the gangs, how big a problem is gangs at the moment in London because the average person picks up their copy of the Evening Standard and they will see, you know, another boy stabbed to death. Tragic. Where do you see the gang problem in London? How bad is it? And is it worse than we actually think it is? Uh, I don't know if it's worse. I mean, of course, we do a very good job. I'm not the best person to talk to in a way yeah. because our children, we do such a good job of protecting them mm. that they are, they don't necessarily have the, the typical experience of, of children elsewhere. We're persuading parents to give up smartphones. We're persuading parents to pick them up after school or et cetera, et cetera. Now, sometimes, you know, we have issues, but um, I don't know if it's worse. I mean, there is a problem. There's a problem. There, there are so many problems. There are so many issues that children come up against. Like you were talking about girls, for instance, on social media. If you allow your child to have a smartphone and it's, it's a, she's a girl, all she understands about her self-worth is you've got to make yourself look f five years older. You've got to pout your lips and stick your bottom out and make yourself look really sexy because that's all you're worth. Mm. The idea of being a powerful woman one day and running your own business or being a lawyer or whatever it is, they, th th that doesn't exist in that world. Um, it, it's, really, it, it's, it's really frightening. And what I'm always trying to get across to parents, and uh, I do the same on Twitter and so on, is... Uh, don't fool yourself, parents. They, some people who argue with me and say, I trust my child. I'm like, <laughs> okay, you know, fine. I could tell you about poor Brett Bednar, who at 14 years old was gaming with his friends. There was one boy in the gaming ring that uh, his mother didn't know. She was a wonderful mother. You know, she used to do baby swimming with him when he was a baby and all this. Um, and then there was this other boy, and over two years, he was gra gradually groomed, you know, and he loved this boy and thought he was so brilliant. And one day this boy sent him money to get into a cab, went to his house, was tied to a chair with duct tape and had his throat slit. Now, if his mother had not allowed him unsupervised access to the Internet, that boy would be alive today. And what happens? I could tell you about Kaylee. I could tell you about Molly the other day, who uh, sadly committed suicide because of all the self-harm images she was sent by via uh, Instagram and via um, it may have been Snapchat. Actually, I don't want to I don't know which one it was. It was one of them. And uh, Pinterest kept on sending um, uh, these these images and even though you try and get off these images you can't because the algorithms are such that the more you click on them the more they keep sending you and uh, Parents don't know Molly's parents didn't know and then they say every time this happens parents make a video they make some video about um, it, to, to warn other parents they say please listen to me listen to what I'm saying nobody watches these videos, right? Um, so I show this to my parents and I say, you know, listen you know, listen to what I'm saying. You're putting your child's life in danger. Now, that's the worst end of it. Then there's just the point of, well, what about their GCSEs? You know, so many of them are addicted, so they can't get off their smartphone when they're working at night. And they're saying to us, please, miss, help me. My mom isn't home because she's working three jobs. So she can't take the phone away from me. What do I do? I'm addicted and I can't get ready for my GCSEs. Um, it's a major problem. And I, I genuinely think that uh, the smartphone will increase the division between the poor and the rich. Because it's the rich who argue with me and who constantly say to me on Twitter, oh, but my child is fine. What are you talking about? And I'm telling you because they're at home. They have the nannies and the tutors and they're able to monitor their child's use of social media. And what they don't understand is that those ideas filter through, especially when journalists. So I was I, I spoke to Toby Young recently and I was telling him off for for saying that Fortnite was OK because he writes about these things. And I said, you are a talking head and you have responsibility. You cannot uh, talk about this stuff because actually your boy is probably going to be fine. But what happens is those ideas trickle down to my families. And we at school are struggling on the ground. The people who support me 100% on Twitter when I say this stuff are teachers 
because the teachers get it. They see it. And I'm telling you in 20 years, there will be controls on these things. They will be giving out warnings just like they do for cigarettes and alcohol and driving and getting married and having sex. All of these things are banned to children. And I'm telling you, I was just thinking about it on the, on the tube on the way here today. I was watching all these people on their phones. And I was thinking, isn't it interesting how Steve Jobs has given this extraordinary thing to people and he's not here to see just how damaging it is. It's an incredible point because I remember when I, before I left my job, I was a year six teacher. So for our overseas uh, viewers and listeners, that's 10 and 11. It's the last year of primary education in this country. And we used to run sex ed lessons in the last year. And I had quite a few parents come in going, I don't want my child learning about sex. I don't want them learning about anything. And I said, your kid's got an iPhone 6. Exactly. They know more about sex than you do. Exactly. Exactly. But they don't, they don't they realize. They don't realize. That's it. People don't realize. And people say, why am I anti-phone and then I'm on, the twi on Twitter? Because I'm an adult. I can make decisions about how I'm going to spend my time, of course. But children are children. It's one of the biggest mistakes we make in teaching and generally in society these days is that we treat children as experts. We think that children are like us. They're not. They need guidance. They need us to, to make decisions for them, right? We do. Like people say to me, so at 10 years old, when they're looking for a school, a secondary school, often families will say, well, you know, it's up to him. He, he, he should decide. And I say, so when he was four, did you choose his primary school or did he? They say, oh, no, we chose his primary school. And I say, so why is it any different? Mm, yeah. <laughs> why is it any different? You need to choose him for his school now. He's, he will choose his school according to where his friends are going. Is there a big sports hall? I mean, he's not going to think about things that matter. And that is what's key is that we need to recognize that children are children and it is our duty to look after them. Do you think that this uh, discomfort with authority that you talked about uh, is, is, it, is it a broader issue in society? Because it seems to me that it's not just education. Like, I, I, I'll go play basketball in my local park and I'll see these parents chasing their child yes. who is determining where they go, what mm -hmm. they do, what kind of food the family eats. It's all determined by a five-year-old. That's right. That's right. And that, and that becomes standard. And in fact, uh, as, a fa as a parent, if you try and take a harder line with your child, your friends look at you as if you are the unreasonable one. Right? And if you're made to feel like that, then the social pressure that you feel around you is to be is to let the child lead things. And I mean, of course, children need to have choices about things. You know, do you want ketchup with your food or not? That's fine. But what school do you want to go to? I mean, clearly, it's the parents who should be making that decision. And it's interesting that those the points that you raised there were fascinating. I wanted to talk to you because I, I wanted to get your opinion on this. We've got a crisis in this country with teaching and teacher retention rates. People qualify, they do the PGCE, we spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions, getting teachers through this system. The postgraduate certificate of education, they stay, what is it, maximum something like five years? Mm -hmm. They drop out of the system. What are the problems with teaching in this country? Well, uh, the two big things are behavior and workload. Those are the two big things. So the behavior, I mean, look, if you're being told to F off every day, People don't want to do that, right? I mean, you know. Well, we're comedians. That happens to us all the time. <laughs> yes, I suppose. And it takes a particular type of person. But most people yeah. Yeah. don't want to be told to F off. Yeah. Don't want that, that adrenaline having to pump all the time because you feel like you're going to war. That shouldn't be happening, right? Um, and so teachers will leave for those reasons. Uh, but they'll also leave because of workload. And um, the workload, of course, is caused in part because of behavior. And it's also caused because... Um, if the teaching methods, and I keep referring to these teaching methods, if you're having to move amongst the desks and you're doing all of this uh, so-called creative work, which isn't creative at all, uh, it actually stunts learning, uh, there's then a lot of pressure on you for the children to achieve, but the only way to make them to achieve is to teach them properly. So it can be very confusing for a teacher. Well, you want me to teach this way, and that's what senior team keep telling me to do, but if you want me to get the results, then... Well, I, I have to do that. So I have to teach in a traditional manner. So you, you move between the two, not quite sure what to do. Sadly, people think about traditional teaching. They think it just means rote learning. And yes, there are some things you want to rote learn. So you do want to rote learn your times tables. You do want to rote learn your dates in history. But that doesn't mean you're rote learning everything. You're still having class discussions. We do pair work with the children where they discuss, turn to your partner, we say, and then they discuss quickly. And then we say, hands up. And then they all have a bit of a class discussion on it. Um, 
They obviously do independent work as well, where they're writing out essays and they're analyzing things. It, you don't not have analysis uh, when you do traditional teaching. In fact, <clears throat> it's at the heart of traditional teaching. Sadly, people can interpret traditional teaching to mean everyone's just sat there, wrote learning something, and repeating stuff back to the teacher. That is certainly not the case. All of our visitors at Michaela would testify to say, obviously, that is not the case at Michaela. But it's unfortunate that it can be uh, an interpretation of that. And I think that's why traditionalism has had a bad name. And over the last 50 years, gradually it has disappeared from our schools. And do you think it's because parents have had a bad experience at school with certain teachers and then they come into school with their prejudices intact going, well, I had a bad experience at school. Therefore, I don't like teachers. Therefore, I don't like the education system. So I'm not going to want to engage with it. Yeah, I mean, that is certainly the case uh, for a number of families in the inner city and so on. You'll find that. But I'm talking more about um, the politicians, the people with uh, voices out there who talk about what works or even the teachers themselves. Uh, they are seduced. So Ken Robinson, for instance, mm. uh, who has the largest number of views uh, for a TED Talk, uh, of all TED Talks, right? I mean, there's five million or something mad. I mean, it's just he, so many people love him. And they love him despite the fact that 99% of what he says is wrong. Uh, it really is. I say 99% because the stuff he says on ADHD is actually correct. But the rest of it is all wrong. He mistakenly... Uh, uh, thinks that traditional education is bad for children when it's what teaches them. And he promotes uh, progressive education, which is um, which which is about uh, supposed creativity. Um, and I say supposed creativity because the only way in which you can be creative is through gaining lots of knowledge. Uh, you cannot be uh, creative with your artwork unless you have been taught the basics in drawing. You cannot be creative with your music as a musician unless you have been taught the basics in your instrument to be able to learn and move forward. You cannot be a, a, a creative uh, French a comedian, for instance, because you've learned French and you're being a comedian in France. Well, you can't be, pull out those jokes and be really at ease in the French language unless you have learned the basics from the beginning and then moved up. Those, th 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 those are obvious, really, to anybody who understands teaching properly. Sadly, Ken Robinson and the whole progressive movement is very seductive. It, um, they say what he says is, "Oh, I know you had a bad time at school." was because people didn't recognize that you were really talented underneath it all. <laughs> and, and you wanted to be a dancer, didn't you? And if, if somebody had recognized, but instead they forced you to learn those awful times tables, when we should have ignored those and we should have gone with your passion. And people listening, adults go, yeah. That'd make a great yeah. Marks and Spencer's advert, can I just say? <laughs> but, yeah. but, it, but it's interesting that you, know, that you talk about this because I, I, having been a teacher for so long, I agree. The one thing where... I find is that more and more, especially in primary, is we become data factories where we get kids to learn something by rote and then they, they regurgitate it in a test. And in a few weeks later, that knowledge is gone. OK, so what you're saying there is because they've been taught so badly in a progressive fashion for yeah. so long, all teachers. Remember, I said they were confused, yeah. right? They're <clears> confused. <throat> On the one hand, you want me to teach in this trendy way, which isn't really teaching, but we're having fun. And then, on the other hand, you want me to get exams. So what happens is, for years, they're taught in this trendy way, facilitating the learning, yeah. let's all write on sugar paper, I'm going to stick <laughs> things up on the wall, and you're all going to get up, and you're <laughs> going to find them, I'm going to blindfold one of you, it's all going to be fun. And it is fun, it is fun. The children <laughs> are learning about that much content. And then what happens is you get closer to the exams, whether it's the year six SATs or it's the GCSEs at 16, the teachers all go, we got to do something. We got to teach them. We got to learn a whole load of stuff because we got to get it. We got to get through this exam. Mm, and so yeah. that's what. So that is when you bring in the boom, boom, boom. We got to do it. Got to do it. And then people say, Ah, you see, there's too much traditional rote learning in the classrooms. But actually, had they way back at the beginning of year seven or way back at the beginning of year one been doing the rote learning of timetables, had been doing the rote learning of, of, of phonics and so on. If they had learned that stuff properly and really built on the basics, so that you're always building on the basics, building a little bit more, a bit a little bit more, then by the time they get there to those exams, see, you're not teaching towards the exams anymore. You're just, the exam is there, but you know so much. So you know this much stuff and you get examined on that. But what ends up happening in schools, because they haven't really been taught properly for so long, you are then, oh gosh, we've got to get through this exam. So let's just rote learn and get through that exam. And then that's all they're really taught properly. 
That's what ends up happening. Um, and that, that's where the confusion is. So Catherine, explain this to me then, as someone who doesn't know anything about education. None of what you're saying sounds controversial to me at all, <laughs> right? And given, you know, I've seen videos from your school about how the kids behave, and we'll, as I said, we'll look forward to coming and seeing it live. But it seems like a great thing that you've created, right? So why, why are people calling you a Nazi? Why, why, why all this stuff? Obviously, I do look like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, me too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because as I say, the authority and the authoritarian thing. Then uh, we have lots of small C conservative values at the school. Mm -hmm. uh, and people don't like those values. Uh, even the word, you know, small C conservative makes people go, Ooh. Mm. <laughs> you know. Uh, and what are those values? Things like our belief in personal responsibility. Children are responsible for themselves. Um, uh, if you don't get your homework done, well, then that is your responsibility. Often uh, in the more progressive world, they uh, they will want to say, well, it's not his fault. Uh, he he has a difficult home background. His his brother was beaten up last night. Uh, he has a long journey to school. Whatever the reason is, there's always excuses that are made uh, for children, uh, especially children who are poor, uh, who have difficult backgrounds. And so that's why he misbehaved. Often, well, it's because he's having a difficult home life. That's why he's beating up his friends in the yard. You know, I often think I don't see why the two are even connected. Um, and they're not connected at all. But th th the excuse making mechanism just goes into play automatically in schools. Mm -hmm. um, so that's personal responsibility. We believe in duty and obligation. So what I mean by that is uh, we have a duty. I, you notice how I kept saying we, uh, we have a duty to children as adults. Mm -hmm. In the school system, we have a duty to educate children properly. Um, the word duty often has just disappeared from our language that we, um, so children have a duty to each other. I have a duty to behave, not just because I want to make sure I'm staying in my lesson, but because I don't want to disrupt for everyone else. Mm. Um, I have a duty to be kind to my, to my fellow, uh, classmates because that, that's just, that's put upon me by the world, you know? I, I believe in the whole and the team, and I am a team player, as opposed to it's all about me. So that's something we believe. Another thing that we believe, um, we believe that there should be some relation between effort and reward. Uh, so what I mean by that is, in the progressive world, everybody gets a prize. So all must have prizes, <laughs> right? Everybody gets a prize because they feel sad for the ones who don't get the prize. And it comes from a good place, they're thinking, which is that, Oh, what about poor little Johnny, who, 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 who is a nice kid, and we don't want him to lose out. We don't want him to feel bad, so we're going to make sure everybody gets a certificate. The problem with that is that it stops everyone from, from working hard and from trying to achieve. And our big motto is work hard, be kind, right? We want them to work hard. And one of the things that motivates children to work hard is to know, well, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to get rewarded for this, and somebody else hasn't got rewarded for that because I've done the work for it. Um, so we believe there ought to be some kind of relationship between effort and reward. Um, Whereas others, more progressive people, will think that that's just mean. You're being mean to little Johnny. Uh, but we think they're being mean to little Johnny because Johnny is going to stop working because it doesn't matter. Everybody gets And not only will Johnny stop working, but, you know, little David, who, who, find, who, who does work hard, will also stop working because he thinks, well, I'm the same as Johnny. So who cares? Um, and then it all goes out the window. Um, what horrifies me about just that particular thing mm -hmm. is... There is a real world out there, Catherine, isn't there, where these kids are going to go out into and they're mm. going to very quickly find out that you don't get a prize That's for right. being you. You get a prize for working hard, for achieving, for creating. That's, That's right. what you get rewarded for. That's right. That's right. Um, it, it, that's right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, this is people in the world where they, they do this. They do think they're helping the children. I always say... Uh, sadly, with many of these so-called virtues that uh, contradict the ones that I'm talking about, uh, it's re not really about the children. It's about the people who are, who are doing this feeling good about themselves. They want to be able to sit at a dinner party and say, I'm a nice person. I feel really <laughs> good. You know, and they, they want in the moment, mm -hmm. of course, it's not nice handing out a detention. Nobody likes that. And they, they, the progressives who accuse us, they like to paint this picture of they are sadistic and they love hurting children and they want to stand over them and make them be quiet and then say, ha, you're in detention. <laughs> but actually, the reality is what will happen in the lesson is the teacher will say, now, you know, Johnny, turn around. That, that's a demerit. Now, it's a warning, essentially. Johnny, you've turned around. That's a demerit. We need to make sure we're focused. And then when Johnny turns around again, the teacher will say, Johnny, come on. You're leaving me with no choice here. I've got to give you detention. 
Johnny says, yeah, you're right. You know, mm. I, I, did, I did turn around again. I've got the detention. whoop de do. He does a 30 minute detention. He does some work in that detention. Great. I mean, he's actually benefited in some way. Um, but if people continually see that as uh, the teacher somehow getting pleasure out of giving the detention, as opposed to doing their job and doing their duty, mm. right? It's mm. our duty <laughs> to make sure that we give them order. And what I always say is that you, you cannot uh, run a school on detentions. You just can't do it, right? Like you put on all these detentions, there's 600 of them and there's like 50, 60 odd of us. I mean, you know, they, they'll just rebel. Mm. You need the tipping point, right? You need the majority of them to be with you. Mm. The 10% on the edges are kept in line with the tension. But you need 85, 90% of them to get what you're doing and understand it and love it. And so they get a detention, they go, you know what? But I get a great education, so I don't care. I'll sit my 30 minute detention, but I know I'm gonna come out brilliant out of this school. Whereas if I was elsewhere, I wouldn't have this education. Now you talk about the 10% on the edges and I agree with you, but what about the 0.5% who don't respond to detention? Don't respond, the kids that we've all dealt with who you can't seem to get through. The ones who go to the PRU, so those are the pupil referral units, so that in, where, um, which when a kid can no longer be attend a mainstream school. What do we do with those kids? Because there's a problem with expulsion rates and then those kids getting involved in gangs. Yeah, and again, what I would say is that uh, wrongly, schools that are like ours are accused of filling up the bruise when it's exactly the opposite. It's the schools that are chaotic that are constantly having to expel kids because there's chaos. Mm. You have far fewer kids leaving the schools with order because those kids, the kids who are bad, but not that bad, don't ever become that bad mm -hmm. because of the order that keeps them in, in line, right? Um, it's, 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 it's the schools that have total chaos where decent kids become worse and worse. Remember I said earlier about um, you end up having to become a bully in order to survive because your reputation matters, you know? And you have to be super cool. You see that in like Greece, for instance, but you know, it, it's not, it, it's, it's still like nice, you know, white middle-class kids in Greece. Whereas obviously when you're in the inner city, it, it becomes a lot more, you know, when he's saying I have a rep to protect and all that kind of thing, yeah. and you want to be a T-bird and you want to be super cool and you want to not be in lessons. You know, that kind of behavior, uh, it's because the T-birds are, are in control. They're running things. Mm. That happens far less in a school with order. But yes, I mean, there, have to, there ought to be prus, and, and, and if a child gets uh, excluded, they need to go there. Although I have to say, children never stay permanently in a pru. What, ten, what always happens is that they're moved to another secondary school to give them another start. So people outside of education think, oh my goodness, isn't this terrible? Well, actually, they go there, and the, the idea is, well, they go to that pru, and then they'll go to a different secondary school and hopefully have a better start. The problem is, is that if the secondary school that they go to is chaotic, then they just go back to being a chaotic kid, mm. right? Well, you know, I was thinking uh, when you talk about discipline and uh, how, how you kind of keep that 10% in line, I probably would have been when I was a kid at school, I was quite rebellious. What I always found is I kind of, like you say, I always knew where the line was. Exactly. And, and so if, if I was called out and proper, appropriately punished for a misdemeanor of some kind. Yes. That restricted me from becoming more rebellious. Exactly. That kept me very much in check. Exactly. That's I exactly right. So what I always say is you don't see the kids taking their clothes off and running around the corridors naked, do you? <laughs> because they know that that's just like completely unacceptable. Mm. They just don't do it, right? Mm. They could do it. I mean, they could, but they don't do it, right? I once had an autistic <laughs> boy do that. Okay, so there is the extreme. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. But yeah. in all your years of teaching, you have one example. In my 25 years of teaching, I don't know any. Like, I, yeah. I've never seen that. Yeah. So. The fact is that there are certain things the children will not do, yeah. right? And that's because the school, it's just obvious you don't do that. Yeah. So at Michaela, it's obvious that you wouldn't walk away from your teacher if your teacher was talking to you. Yeah. Often teachers come and they say, but what do you do when the kid just gets up and walks out of the lesson? <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, well, I don't know. Uh, we, that doesn't really happen here. Yeah. Uh, well, what do you do when, when the child just swears at you and marches off? Well, it doesn't really happen at Michaela, right? The, the, the point is that um, it's what you said. Children will, will go to the boundary. They know how to play the game. Mm. They know how far they can push it. And the, the cool ones will push it that far because they're saying to everybody, look at me. So you know what our kids do? 
It's really funny. In, the, in, in our silent, because we have silent corridors, again, people say, oh my goodness, that's so oppressive. Well, they happily move very quickly from one lesson to the other, as opposed to having their heads bashed in, which is what happens when in schools with challenging intakes. I understand that schools without challenging intakes, you don't need this. So it depends on the, the level, what, what kind of intake you have. But our kids move along happily in silence. And because they're in silence, their way of rebelling is to go, mmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they do, right? And then so somebody will come to me and say, we've got an issue, Catherine. We're hearing mmm in the corridors. <laughs> and I always laugh and think, isn't it great that that's what they've had to do? That's the issue, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's... And, that's, and that's where my staff are going, oh my goodness, we've got an issue. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I laugh. I think it's hilarious. So what do you do at the school? You have the, you have the boot camp, which you do before, which is kind of teaching yeah. kids how to behave. And that's really key. You have the silent corridors. Like, talk us but through the, the whole system. Thing. Yeah, the boot camp is really important because the thing is, you can have all these rules, but you must support the children in achieving the rules. You can't just say, right, you've got detentions, got detentions. To get your 85%, 90% of kids to really buy in, and to be honest, I think we got 100%, even the, even the naughtiest kids in the school, they'll all say to you, yeah, but you know what, at least I learn here. You know, they'll all say that. But they're still only being kept in line because they've got detentions. Whereas the 80 to 90% there, they're, they're really bought in. They really get it. And when you talk to the kids, come and have lunch, you'll see. You'll be on mixed tables and you'll see them all saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do get detentions, but we really like it. We like that. <laughs> you know, they'll even thank their teachers for giving them detentions. They will actually do that. And people say, oh, that's really weird. Well, yeah, but they, our kids understand that it's through detentions that having those detentions manage to keep, manages to keep order. Now, why do they get it? We spend six days at the beginning of every September. Uh, the rest of the school doesn't come back. We only have the year sevens arrive. And we teach them how to behave in the Michaela way. So it's unfair to expect behaviors of children where you haven't taught them how to do mm. it. We also heavily support them. So we expect them to bring certain equipment every day. We have an equipment shop that's open every morning in the school. The kids run it. Right. So you can turn up in the morning with your 10p and buy a pen and then you don't get into trouble. You don't get a detention for not having one. Mm. So you have got to have the support mechanisms around them in order to enable them to meet the standards that you want. And as long as you do that, your, your children will meet their standards. And do you ever have an issue with parents, which is what I sometimes used to have? And I know a lot of teachers have. Well, you kid give a kid a detention and the parent comes in and goes, why have you given why have you given my child a detention? You know, how dare you, blah, 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 blah. I've heard my child's version of events. They said it was X's fault. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, although I have to say it's quite rare with us, and that's because at the beginning, uh, when they join the school, I tell them I am the dragon lady. <laughs> Do not mess with me. And I'm really, I say it like that. I say to them, the day I send my child to your school, I will do what you say. You are now sending your child to me, and he's mine. And I'm very, sen I'm very, very serious about that. So they get it. They get it and they just kind of think, ooh, you know, um, when it comes to me. And that's quite good because I want to have this kind of Wizard of Oz effect, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so they, they don't really do that um, as much. I mean, now and again they do. But generally speaking, they get it. Not only that, but obviously if the kids are getting a great education and the parents know it, they then just accept it. Mm. They too go, you know what, I, I'm really annoyed about the fact that he got that attention, but the school's really good. And he has learned his times the tables and he didn't know them the whole way through primary school. And now he knows them. So actually, I'm just this is this, this, I'm just going to put up with it. I want to move a little bit onto the political side of this, because it's something that you've talked about in the past and, and just where the opposition to what you're doing comes from, because, mm -hmm. you know, if everything what that you're saying is true, which, which it is, right, then you would want every school in the country to be like that, wouldn't you? Yeah. And yet it seems to be that you're getting a lot of pushback rather than, you know, people coming in and going, yeah, we need to transform the education system along these lines. Yeah, that's right. Why is that? Uh, well, I suppose it's the same idea. You know, they're anti-authority. They're anti-responsibility for kids. They want them to be, we want to make excuses for them. So all of those standard uh, issues, oh, it's racism that stopped me from having the life I wanted. It's sexism. It's, um, it's because I came from a single parent family. It's because I grew up on that estate. There are always these reasons. And you know what? I'm not saying that none of that stuff is true, right? But the fact of the matter is that if you don't take responsibility yourself and say, okay, you know what? There's racism in the world, but 
I'm going to negotiate my way around it because I have to. Because mm. otherwise, what am I going to do? Sit on my deathbed and say, well, I could have had this great life, but, you know, I was black, so here you go. I mean, mm. like, <laughs> what, what kind of madness is that? And what people don't seem to understand is if you keep telling a black child, well, the, the, the world is racist, you can't possibly ever succeed, he gives up, right? You have got to have a, a, a can-do mentality, you know? And... Um, uh, it's the business about wanting to sit around the dinner table and feel good about yourself. Uh, I think a lot of people in positions of power and um, influence like to feel that they are the knights in shining armor who are swooping in to save the poor children. <laughs> um, and um, they swoop in with all the wrong ideas and they ruin these children. Right. They, they have blood on their hands as far as I'm concerned. They really do. Some of these people, uh, politicians who who just push um, all the wrong ideas and ruin these children's chances in life. Um, but then they get to sit around at dinner parties and say, oh, but aren't I wonderful? Um, look at me. I, I've just, you know, standards is, is, you know, we need to just give more money, just give more money. And I'm not going to say no to more money. I'd mm. love more money mm. at school. But um, I, I, I wish somebody was talking about in positions of power. I wish somebody was talking about uh, the right kinds of ideas. And sadly, often the people who are talking about more money are also pushing the wrong ideas. Um, and, um, and that's, that is upsetting for me because I have known thousands, tens of thousands of children in my lifetime who I think have been failed by the system. Um, and, and, and we could have, we spend 90 billion a year on education, more than some countries in Eastern Europe who will beat us in PISA, like Lithuania. There, there are various countries in Eastern Europe who beat us in, in the international tests. Um, and they spend uh, uh, 20% what we spend on, on our education system. Um, I, I, and as I say, I want more money. So I'm not saying I don't want more money. <laughs> but um, over the labor years recently, they doubled the expense mm. on the education system and results have flatlined. So it is not about spending more money. It, it, it is about, um, it's about the ideas in the education system. But what I'm really happy about is that People are coming. They come every day to our school. People are changing. I do feel like we are winning. I do. Mm. I mean, I, look, it's a very slow win. And I feel like <laughs> I'll be doing this for the next 50 years, you yeah. know. Mm. Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure that the real change will come in my lifetime. But you, as a, you know, as an individual, we all have a duty to contribute to society and to make the world a better place. And, and when I get to my deathbed, I will hand the baton on to someone else. Mm. Well, it's interesting that you say that because not to compare what we do with obviously the great work that you do, but we feel like the, the reason we started the show is we wanted to start to have some of the more honest conversations about different topics. Uh, and the pushback we've had is exactly the pushback that you've had. And, uh, you know, I understand from particularly what Francis tells me that the, the kind of the teaching world is very left wing and dominated by mm. that strain of thinking. Same with comedy, you yes. know, and we're now finding that we're being ostracized in our world right. and we're Nazis and we're right wing and all this crazy stuff. And it's just amazing to me, like with us, the, we were talking uh, earlier before we started the show about how, you know, we just talk. Right. At the end of the day, we're just comedians or we're just doing the show. But you actually have results to prove the, the merit of what you're doing. And somehow people are still able to ignore you, ignore that, to criticize that. That's what doesn't make sense to me. Well, of course, those most of those people haven't been to the school. Mm. Right. So uh, they make stuff up about the school and they say how miserable it is and so on. They have no idea. But why? Why would they do that? Because they need to feel good about themselves at the dinner party. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really is about, and they're ideologues. Mm. I mean, I, they, they refuse to change their minds. I mean, the irony is they say we don't change our minds. I mean, I am somebody who's completely changed my mind over the years. Mm. You know, I, I used to be a, a progressive teacher. I, I, I would try out these methods in my classroom and I think, well, they don't really work. And so over the years, I have developed my ideas about things and I'm constantly developing them now. Uh, six months ago or a year ago, you never heard me talk about social media at all. And the reason was because we only had the little ones at school. We've now got year seven through to 11. So we've got up to 16 year olds. And it's only become really apparent to me in the last six months or so just how dangerous social media is. And so I've now started my whole campaign about that. And we've got digital drop off and digital detox happening at school. I didn't explain digital drop off where the kids, they can drop off their phones at school from Monday to Friday, for instance, and have a bit of a break so that their brains can start working again. Um, 
I never did that before. There's a big change in my thinking. Um, there are so many massive changes. The, the turn to your partner stuff, we didn't used to do until maybe a year and a half, two years ago. Um, Ruth Miskin, who is, um, she, she does the Read, Write, Ink uh, phonics for schools, and she's an incredible woman. She came to visit, so she was a guest, right? A guest visited the school and said, I really like it, Catherine, but I wish you'd do more turn to your partner. And I said, well, we do do it, because we, we did do it then. And, um, and I said, well, she said, yeah, well, you know, you don't do it very often. And I said, well, how often would you want to see it in a lesson? And, and I said, we probably do it about five or six times. And she said, well, Catherine, actually, I would expect to see it maybe 25, 30 times. What? And um, yeah, so, and the reason, so she explained. And the reason is you, you're, you're, you, instead of cold calling the kids, cold calling meaning you're just asking the kid to give an answer and, and they give the answer cold, right? You, you, do, you do warm calling and warm calling, you do the, the turn to your partner first. So you've kind of practiced your answer with your friend and you, you've checked, is it right? Yeah, I think so, okay. And then you put your hand up afterwards. You are more likely to feel confident in answering than you would do if you were cold called. Um, she explained all of that to me and so on. So I said, you know what, let's try this. So we started doing it more and more and it really, it was fantastic. So now we do it across the school and it's really great. Now that was a guest who visited, let alone what my teachers say to me and say, you know, Catherine, this isn't working. Let's try and do this. And then I talk about it with my senior team and we say, okay, everybody. And I stand up on briefing on Monday morning and I say, we're going to try this way now. We're going to try that way. We are constantly changing our minds. When I talk to head teachers, I always say the thing that you need to do as a head teacher is constantly be questioning what you're doing and thinking, am I doing this because that's what's always been done? Or am I doing this because this is what works? And I think, sadly, in education, there's far too much of uh, doing stuff because that's what's, it's what's always been done. Um, I think it's really exciting time in education. Mm. It's really exciting because people are, uh, are, are, are coming to, they're starting to change their minds. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, the conversation between knowledge and skills and traditionalism and progressivism just didn't exist. Before Michael Gove, it didn't exist. Michael Gove changed, uh, changed the game in education big time. And free schools changed the game in, in, in education because coupled with him doing the political stuff, free schools then, like ours, for instance, a few of them have done things differently on the ground. And... Uh, and other teachers now are able to benefit from, from seeing that. I mean, we had an event last night. There were all these uh, languages teachers. My languages department ran it about the kinds of methods that they use in their classroom. And all these teachers came and um, could look and see and learn from us and, and could privately say to me, I really like what you're saying on Twitter, but I would never say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that really annoys me is when somebody who is not white comes out and espouses a conservative value of whatever it may be and they're accused of being a traitor to their own race or having internalized racism or all this kind of stuff have you experienced that have you had people accuse you of that yes <laughs> <laughs> yes um definitely i mean it is interesting because i often wonder why uh on the whole I don't wonder, but I, I think I, I think about the fact <laughs> that the black left often leave me alone. They do. So they'll attack uh, Sean Bailey or they'll mm. attack um, Tony Sewell or they'll attack. They attack various people. They tend to leave me alone. And I think that that's because over the years when I was working in schools, I used to know a lot of these people and they they know that I'm doing good work. They've known me throughout my career and I'm, you know, I'm 45 years old. I've been doing this a long time and they've seen me work with children and they've seen how committed I've been. You know, I'm at school at 6, 15, 6, 30 in the morning every day and I've done this all my life. You know, um, they've seen the commitment to the children who they want to see succeed. And I think they give me a bit of a break, actually. Um, but I know exactly what you mean. And I do have... Um, people who will attack me. I have to say it's mainly been from the white left, not so much from the black left. And I, and I do think that's because the black left really understand what I'm doing. They get it and they, they, they have to respect it and they, they respect me, although they probably find some of the things I say uncomfortable. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And what, what particular things do you think they find uncomfortable with what you say? Um, what is it? So Lee Jasper, for instance, is an interesting guy. Like I know him and, uh, you know, we follow each other on Twitter and, um, you know, I, I disagree with much of what he says. And, uh, and 
I often wondered to myself, actually, has he just muted me on Twitter? Because how can he stand to, <laughs> to read my tweets? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I do. I wonder this. Um, I think, and I think he just gives me a pass. I think he gives me a pass. And why? And what would upset him? It would upset him that I'm not being uh, more critical of the right, probably. Mm -hmm. um, that I am that I like, I don't know, Michael Gove, for instance, um, that I, you know, I, I, I don't think, though, that he would have a problem with me saying that children need to be responsible for themselves. Mm. I know, I, I've heard him say this to black kids myself, you know, yeah. so I've heard him say these things. It's just that there's this kind of war between the right and the left all the time. And what's really sad is that the left have convinced themselves that the right only think what they think because they want to hurt people. Mm. You know, they want to get rich, so they want to play golf. And you know what? There are some right-wingers like that, okay? <laughs> so that's fine. But there are a whole bunch of people on the right who want the same things as the people on the left. They just think that they're going to get those things through different methods. Um, and it, if the left are convinced, that's what I mean about, I think the black left are not, don't think I'm evil. They don't. Mm. They think I'm a good person. Mm. And they think that what I'm doing is good. And so they let me get on with it. Mm. Um, I think too often on the white left, they just can't process the idea that, um, that I might be doing good because they, they are very uncomfortable with um, some of the things I said. And you said, what are those things? I mean, that's what I was saying, the relationship between effort and reward, the idea that um, duty to the team and all of that, the, the, the personal responsibility, not making excuses for kids, um, the idea that we ought to give out detentions and that, no, I'm not, like, there's lots of people on the left who think that we should give out detentions, but they'll make excuses for some to not get that detention. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, now you're looking at me like, I don't understand. It's oh, they not that controversial. Like all solid Nazi values to <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, well, what is it? What is it? Okay, dead white men. That's a big one, right? Mm. Dead white men. So I believe that we should be teaching Shakespeare and, I don't know, Dickens and so on. Um, and what people will say, people will often say, so this is something I think Lee Jasper would have take issue with me, is that... Unless children can see themselves in the novel, uh, then they can't identify with it and they're unable to get as much from it. So why are black children misbehaving? It's because they're having to read about white characters as opposed to black characters. That might be an argument that would be put forward. And um, I would say that life isn't just about race. Uh, Shakespeare speaks to everyone. Um, in fact, Maya Angelou uh, uh, you s would say that uh, she said that she, when she first read Shakespeare, that she thought that um, he was a black woman because there was no way that anyone could understand the plight of black women so well <laughs> in the way that he did. Uh, it's universal. Um, and you as a person can transcend. You're not just black. Like you're a whole bunch of different things. You're a person. You can read Dickens and get something out of it, whatever color you are. And I, I, it's those it's identity politics where people can only understand you as well. I'm what are you? Right. Well, I'm a woman and I'm black and I'm uh, mixed race and I'm I don't know whatever. But actually, I'm somebody who's a little bit crazy and I'm uh, I'm a real radical and a rebel and I and I want to change things. Those things that I just said are far more important, actually, to who I am mm. than me being black and female, mm. right? Mm. So I, I just, I'm not saying I'm not black, right? I'm not saying I'm not female, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, it's not all consuming. And um, I think many people on the left are consumed with that. They can't see past it. Uh, and I just don't see the world in the same way. Well, we've got time for a couple of quick questions. The good work that you do, it's obviously, you know, there have been times when that's been difficult for you, right? And you've continued to do it and you've built this great school and I'm sure it will keep going from strength to strength and we hope it will. Uh, but what is, I'm always curious about the personal element of it. What is it inside of you? People always say that. <laughs> that. That makes you want to have that battle? Yeah, people always say that. It's all those children. It's all those children over the years who I have known. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of children who I've seen, not just the children I've taught, children I've seen in schools that I've visited all around the world. I, I just, for me, I can see that education is the number one thing that is going to allow them to change their stars. And the reason why I went into teaching and the reason why I do what I do is because I want to enable disadvantaged children to be able to change their stars. Um, 
you know, when I gave my speech at the Conservative Party conference and I was told I would never work in the state sector again, um, I did consider for about five minutes uh, going to work in the private sector. But then I thought, well, I don't want to do that because the reason why I'm motivated to wake up in the morning is to change the, chi the lives of these children. Um, and, you know, I'm all for private school and I'm ha quite happy that there are private schools. It's just not where really? I want to work. Yeah, I don't have a problem with them. They're fine. But I want to work with disadvantaged kids and I want to change their lives. And what is very sad is that these well-meaning people, I say they're well-meaning, but they also want to be sitting around dinner parties and feeling happy about themselves, are, are, have created a culture of, of, of low expectations for the children who I teach, you know, the, the, for the, well, those tens of thousands of children. And um, their stories, the, the, the many children I have seen bullied in my life and so on, I, they're the ones who motivate me because I just want to reduce the numbers of them. I want every, I want all children to be given a chance at equality of opportunity, right? That's what I want. I want them to have the chance, right? Um, and most of them do not have the chance. And, and that's, that's, where, um, that's where the left is right in that sense. Too many children are, do not have a chance at equal opportunity. But what the left don't understand is they are the ones who are taking that chance from them. Spoken like a true Nazi. All right. <laughs> <laughs> our last question. Um, so what is the thing? Well, this is a, the, the way we wrap up all our interviews, Catherine. What is the thing that we're not talking about as a society, but we really should be talking about? Yeah. OK, I need to think about that one. Um, I mean, because there's loads of things that I just spoke about that I don't think we're, 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 we're talking about and we should. Uh, well, I suppose it's the... It's the small C conservative values that I was referring to before um, that I think people on the left and the right often don't have. Um, certainly, there are many big C conservatives who are not small C conservatives. Mm. Um, and I know uh, left wingers who, you know, often Catholics and <laughs> who are very much small C conservatives. Um, and I think people see small C conservatives as judgmental and as um, bad people. And actually, uh, judgment isn't always bad. And uh, if the more we lose those values in, in, in society, the more society crumbles away. Uh, the reason why um, the West has been so successful is because those values, we used to have religion that brought us together, which has fallen away. Those values uh, kept, gave us order and structure because it's not just children who need order and structure, Society needs it too. And when you have a free-for-all where everybody just gets to do what they want and everybody can just, I can want to be me and I have to discover me and so on. And, and they have no sense of duty and obligation. They have no sense of, of how they can give to others, you know, throughout life. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm doing something with my life so that I can pass the baton on at the end. Um, it's what gives your life meaning. It's what gives, it, 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 it is what holds a society together. And, and sadly, I think we've lost that. Well, Catherine Burble Singh, the dragon lady, <laughs> thank you very much for coming on Trigonometry. Uh, you're on Twitter at... Yes, at Miss underscore Snuffy, which I have to explain, because yeah. that sounds a bit <laughs> odd for a, a headmistress, Snuffy being S-N-U-F-F-Y. Um, because when I used to write a blog called To Miss With Love, uh, I was Miss Snuffleupagus. Uh, the, the big mammoth elephant in uh, Sesame Street who could never be seen, so the elephant in the room, and eventually it got shortened to Miss Snuffy. There we go. Well, so follow Catherine on Twitter. She's always posting great and very interesting stuff. I follow her with great interest. As always, follow us at TriggerPod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, click that bell button next to the subscribe button. And as Francis always says, do give us a review on iTunes. We've got like 40 now. We could use a few more. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for tuning in. We will see you in the week from now with another brilliant episode. Take care, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.